So can I bring up Miss Sarah Tempty? That was like the sweetest intro. <laughs> Thank you. Hey everyone, how are we doing? <laughs> Woo! Um, like Alex, or like, I looked at Alex back there and said like Alex. Like Brad said, I'm Sarah Tempty. I do offer creation and copywriter for online business owners. And I'm so pumped to chat with you today. I wanna talk to you for a second about how I got into this offer creation thing. So I used to feel like my identity was doing it all. Has anyone felt that way? Who's the do-it-all type of person? Yeah, <laughs> all the hands go up. I think it's part of the entrepreneur's curse. It's also a blessing sometimes, but it's part of the entrepreneur's curse. And I, wa I grew up wanting to do everything. I mean, I, I graduated from college at the same time that I graduated from high school. I wrote my thesis for my master's degree in a week. I, start <laughs> I started a business at the same time that I was getting married and teaching internationally. And that was what I was addicted to, was doing everything. And then the universe cut me off. I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder. I suddenly went from needing four hours of sleep a night to needing 12 to 14 hours of sleep a night. Um, and it wasn't like the cute, sexy kind of burnout. <laughs> it was like I was eating peanut butter for three meals a day. I was taking client calls from bed and telling them, oh, I'm sorry, my webcam's broken. Like, that's why I can't turn my video on. But really, I just hadn't gotten out of bed yet that day. Um, has anyone been there? <laughs> Okay, um, and this was at about the time that I was shifting from freelance mode where I was like hustling on Upwork, hustling in Facebook groups, taking random writing gigs, and really wanting to turn my passion into a real business. But because of the health stuff that was going on in my life, I was really forced to build my business within constraints. I didn't have 24 hours a day that I could be hustling. I didn't have even 12 or eight hours. I had like four to six hours on a good health day and sometimes less than that. But honestly, that turned out to be the biggest gift because from the very beginning, I was forced to get really specific about what would serve me, about what would serve my clients, about what would move my business forward because I didn't have room for clutter. I didn't have room for busy work. I didn't have room for doing things that didn't move the needle. And so I zeroed in really quickly on, for me, what worked to move my business forward. And offer creation um, was a huge part of it. Like one of the biggest things that I learned was that when you build an epic offer, everything gets easier. Marketing gets easier because you have something to talk about that people actually want. You're no longer like dragging people into your program. Who's ever felt like you have to drag people into your thing? Um, I've found that sales gets easier because you're on the phone with people who are already telling you, this is exactly what I've been looking for. I have talked to, like in my case, since I'm a copywriter, I've talked to 10 copywriters and no one's been able to talk to me like this. Um, and I found that actually delivery gets easier because I built offers that took people from start to finish in the fastest, clearest path. And I also, because of my energy constraints, I built offers that didn't require me to babysit my clients because I didn't have the energy or the capacity for that. I didn't have the capacity for unlimited access, for doing it all, for scope creep. I had to be really tight with the way that I delivered my offers so that I could give people amazing results and really deliver on that promise in a really efficient way. Now, I know that most of you probably aren't dealing with chronic illness, but I'm guessing that you're probably dealing with something else. You have some other constraint or struggle in your life, whether that is, um, maybe it's as simple as having a family. Maybe you have kids at home that are taking up hours a day and you're looking at, you know, 21 year, entre 21 year old entrepreneurs and saying, dang, I'm a little jealous that they have, seem to have unlimited time to do this thing. 
Um, maybe you have uh, something that feels like a constraint in your personality. Like, I'm not extroverted. I'm not naturally good with words. I'm not naturally organized. I'm not naturally bold. Like, whatever that story is or whatever that innate part of you is, it feels like it's holding you back. And my challenge to you as we go into talking about offers would be to step back for a second and recognize that that piece of your story or that piece of your struggle might be your greatest gift. Because for me, that has been true. This health thing that has felt really heavy sometimes, that's made me look at entrepreneurs who seem healthy and energetic and they're like posting about being in the 4 a.m. club and they're like, I get more done by 7 a.m. than most people do in a week. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm definitely not even awake yet. Um, <laughs> but that's truly allowed me to build a business that serves me. And because it serves me, it allows me to serve my people at a greater level. So your constraint, your struggle, it might be your greatest gift in two different ways. One, it could actually impact the offer that you deliver. So for example, I worked with a uh, fitness coach and she had just had a baby and she was devastated. She wasn't devastated about the baby. She was thrilled about the baby and devastated because she was dealing with some postnatal injuries that made her feel like she was no longer qualified to be a fitness coach. She couldn't do, because of her pelvic floor health, she couldn't do CrossFit anymore. She couldn't ride horses anymore. She couldn't jump on trampolines anymore. And she felt like her business was just going to be ripped away from her. And this thing that she built up as a big part of her identity, no longer, like she felt like she looked in the mirror and didn't recognize herself because that p element had been stripped away. And she now has actually channeled that into her offer. And she works with um, postpartum women to um, with to do basically she does restorative exercise therapy um, basically helps women rehab from pregnancy become their strongest selves and get back into doing the activities they love the most um, like horseback riding crossfit whatever it may be your constraint or your struggle may not directly impact your offer though it may impact the way that you build your business um, you may be who's an introvert Okay, I am. It impacts the way that I build my business. I've realized that when I try to follow a model that was designed by someone who's extroverted and really feeds off tons of energy, I'm drained by 11 a.m. And so I've learned to just honor that and recognize that by playing my own game and running my own race, it's going to help me create a business that serves me and then frees me to serve at my highest level. So, we're gonna get into this whole offer creation thing, build out the 10 elements of a can't say no offer. But first I wanna just gauge where we're at since I haven't gotten a chance to talk to everyone in the room yet. Who has an offer um, already created, but their main goal right now is to, and you like, you like delivering it, but your main goal is to sell more of that offer? Who's in that place? Okay. Who has built out an offer and they feel trapped by that offer? You don't actually like delivering in it. It feels really heavy. <laughs> okay, been there. Um, who does not have an offer yet? You have like something on your heart, you're passionate, but you want to turn your expertise into that. Okay, cool. So we've got some people in each group. I'll try to speak to all of those. Okay, one reminder first before we get into the tactical side of this offer building. Your program is not your offer. It's one thing I want to be really, really clear about. The course that you deliver, the service that you provide, the mastermind that you welcome people into, that itself is not the offer. Um, so I'm going to use an analogy for this. We're going to talk about homes for a second. Okay, your offer is the blueprint. Your offer is what everything stems from. It's, it's where you've got the vision, it's where you've got the details, um, it's that blue picture in the middle. Your program itself 
is the framed out house. It's the thing you can actually knock on. It's like the PDFs that you can actually print out. It's the event that you can actually invite someone to come show up at. And then your marketing, your copywriting, your messaging is like this 3D rendering of a home that hasn't been built yet. So I realize that might feel a little bit like semantics right now, but I want you to be really clear that at the end of this session, you're walking away with a blueprint. You're walking away with a really clear vision for this thing that you're going to build that house that you're gonna build for your people. And the blueprint is also going to give you what you need to create a really great 3D rendering of your offer in your Facebook posts, on your sales pages, when you're on a sales call with a client. But you really need all three components in order to like round out your marketing suite, okay? Um, and I want to talk about one more thing before we dive into this offer creation. I know that some of you are in the room are stuck on the offer that you're creating, and you've been sitting on that for a while. You have work that you're really passionate about, and you see people out in the world that you know you can change their lives, but the actual tactics of it, the actual delivery of it, you feel like your feet are like four feet deep in quicksand. You don't know how to map out this thing. You're not sure whether you should be doing a course or a mastermind or a workshop or one-on-one -on -one VIP days or done-for-you services. And do you outsource some of the work? Do you do it all? Do you have to record all your videos first? How many worksheets do you need? That all feels really complicated. And then you're also trying to figure out, well, that group needs me, and that group needs me, and I could also probably serve that group. But these are the people that are coming to me, but I'm not actually sure that I want to work with them. Like, they're kind of the annoying people. So where do I go from here? <laughs> and what I want to tell you is that when you're stuck, your brain is always going to answer the questions that you ask. And it's also always going to look for evidence for the statements that you make. So if you're walking around saying, oh man, I really want to do money-making workshops on the beach, but no one's going to buy that, your brain is going to look for evidence that no one's going to buy that. If you walk around saying, oh, it'd be really sweet to do this, but those high school friends on my Facebook profile are going to think I'm nuts. Like, they don't believe in crystals. <laughs> There's no way I'm posting about that. Um, if you are continually walking around in a narrative saying, I don't know which niche to choose, who has verbally said, I don't know who to serve? Your brain's walking around looking for evidence to back that up. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, for the next 40 minutes, that's how long we're going to be in here, Try to suspend or at least just notice those statements. And when you notice yourself slipping into that, change that into a productive question. That question might be, if I did know who to serve, who would those people be? And your brain's going to automatically start working to find an answer to that. It might be, if I created the most fun offer in the world, what would that look like? And your brain's going to start spinning in the background. Your subconscious is going to get to work. Um, if I serve the people group that I most am excited about, who would those people be? If I knew that the offer I put out into the world could not fail, what would I sell? And just let yourself play with that. So I would love for you to find a partner at your table really quick. Just turn to the person next to you. And identify who is partner one and who is partner two. OK. Partner one and partner two, both place your hands on your heart. One hand on your heart. Partner one, I want you to look partner two in the eyes and tell them, 
It is safe for you to make fast decisions. Okay, partner two. Partner two, look partner one in the eyes and say, it is safe for you to make fast decisions. Okay, partner one, we're back to you. You're going to look partner two in the eyes and say, it is safe for you to sell what you want to sell. Partner two, repeat it back. It is safe for you to sell what you want to sell. Okay, how do we feel? <laughs> Woo, safe. <laughs> okay, let's get started. You have a matrix in your workshop, in your workbook. There's three columns on it. You, can, you are free to take notes however you would like to. I feel like the most helpful thing would be in column number one, the left column, to add details about whatever that thing is that I'm talking about. So you'll see like the first one is the promise. Take notes in column one about the promise, what I'm talking about. In column two, my recommendations would be for you to jot down the, one of the examples that I share um, so that you can refer back to that as a sample when you're going through your offers. And then in column three, after each one of these 10 elements that we're going to walk through, I'm going to give you a minute or two to start imagining your next offer or start reimagining your current offer, and that's where you're going to do it. So at the end of the workshop, in column three, you are going to have um, your new offer or a reimagined offer outlined. And I really, like I've been saying, I really want to free you to make those fast decisions, to allow this to be a space to kind of play with new ideas, um, to not hold yourself back with what may not work or what you may still be figuring out. But as we get to that third phase where you're going to be jotting down new ideas, just let whatever comes to mind come up. Um, and it'd be, I would recommend maybe like when you're at dinner or whatever, if you have your workbook with you, it'd be a great time to chat it out with someone um, if there's any spot that you got stuck in, okay? But we're going to get started and move through these 10 ingredients. So number one is the promise that you make. So the promise of your offer is it's a big result, the finish line, the main outcome, the core desire, or the desperate escape that someone is making. Um, and what I want to encourage you with is that it's safe to make big promises. If you're doing the filtering work in your sales process to make sure that only ideal clients come in, clients who've already done the prerequisites, clients who are in the right place to ROI, you don't have to hold yourself back from making a big promise. Because um, you're only going to be accepting people. We're going to talk about sales more later this weekend, but you're only going to be accepting people in who are the right fits. Um, and I often see that if people are hesitant to make big promises, it's either because of that integrity piece, they're fearful, they're like, oh, well, what if someone doesn't get the results? Like, hey, you're going to create some filtering mechanisms to make sure only the right people get in, people who can get that result. The other thing that I see when you're, people are afraid to make big promises is that they're still taking too much responsibility for the client results. Your responsibility is to create the vehicle, provide the resources that you're committed to, provide a path that you know is proven. You're not responsible for actually generating that result. That's on them. And there's a dozen, a million reasons why something could be happening in their heart or mind to keep them from getting there some of the time. That's not on you. So I want you to take that, um, or I'm going to run through actually a couple examples first. So a promise might be in this course, in this training, in this workshop, at this event, I'm going to teach you to build an off-the-grid tiny home. Another promise would be I'm going to help you launch your first course. My recommendation is that for any promise that you make, it should be something that is screenshotable, graphable, movie sceneable, as in like you could take a video of someone doing it, um, 
or photoable. You could take a before and after picture. So depending on your work, one of those may apply more than others. If you are in more of a lifestyle type of offer, where you're promising something like confidence, see if you can turn that emotion word into a situation. So for your audience, for the people that you're imagining serving, would confidence look like turning heads when they walk into a room? Would it look like being, to approach, being able to approach someone they find attractive? Would it mean sending the pitch they've been waiting to send? Would it mean having sex with the lights on? Like, what would confidence look like in that person's life? Turn that emotion word into a scenario and make that part of your promise. Okay, so take the next 60 seconds and jot down some ideas for promises that you could make to your people. Okay, we're gonna go on. Element number two of a can't say no offer is a really clear person and problem. So this is the person who needs you the most and is prepared for change. So that's really important. If you are one of the people who's been bouncing around between three, four, five different groups that you could possibly serve, think of who needs you the most, what's at stake, who has the most at stake, who stands to gain or lose the most if they do or do not work with you, and is that group of people prepared for change? Are they prepared to invest time, resources, energy in the type of solution that you provide? And then you're gonna consider the struggle, the pain, and the situation that they want to escape. This is where they're hurting, this is where there's a gap in their life, where there's something that there's missing. So a couple of examples would be women who have hormonal imbalances, so that would be the group of people and their problem or their struggle or their pain is that they can't lose weight. That they don't feel good in their bodies, that they wake up feeling exhausted. They look up in the mirror and feel like, uh, maybe they feel like they've let themselves down, maybe they feel like they don't see the spark in their eyes that they used to. Um, Another example would be artists who are struggling to make ends meet. So again, the group of people would be artists, and their problem or their pain that they're struggling to make ends meet. If you are unable to define this, it means that your current target audience is too broad. And I want to speak to the people in the room who are doing something that could help anyone and everyone. Um, something like breath work or fitness or meditation, or getting deeper into your passion. We all want that, right? Those are like universal human things, or universal things that could make anyone's lives better. And I know that many of you are here because you have a vision for changing the entire world. But I want you to think about your work like ripples in an ocean, and in order for those ripples to spread really far, it has to start somewhere. And that somewhere is this very tiny circle, and it spreads from there. It gets broader and wider from there. So if you are still in the early phases of your business, you're not Oprah yet, you're not Brene Brown yet, um, I want you to look for the group of people who are in the center of that circle. And I also want you to tell you that there's not a wrong decision. You might be looking at three different groups of people and being like, well, I could help them. Well, I could help them. Well, I could help them. Uh, you could. But trying to help them all at once is you're trying to get to this bigger ripple before you've been in the middle. And you can't get to that bigger ripple without throwing that one stone first. So choose to start somewhere. If you're not sure where, look back into your story. Look back into your struggle. Look at your last 10 clients or the last people you've had conversations with who have been excited, who are ready, um, 
who's wanted to jump in, who is already looking for a solution, who is already aware so that you don't have to like convince them into this thing. Take a minute and jot down some notes about the person and the problem. All right, ingredient number three is positioning. So positioning is your unique angle. It might be the reason you're doing what you're doing, it might be your mission, it might be your unique personality, different elements of your story. Um, who here has ever felt like, why would anyone hire me? There are a million people who are doing what I'm doing. Right, it's like, oh, another Facebook ad agency, another sales coach, another copywriter, I have felt that, another life coach. It can feel like you're one in a million, and your positioning is what sets you apart. So even if your skill set is similar to a dozen or a hundred or a thousand other people, no one else on the planet has the same combination of your skill set and your story, your values, your personality, your life experience. I hire people who I enjoy working with. I've hired a lot of coaches, a lot of service providers, and I'm not just hiring them for their skill set. I'm hiring them for the way they look at the world or the fact that they seem like someone I could have fun with or the type of person that I would want to get coffee with, um, the type of person I would want to travel with. Um, I feel like they would get me and the way that I do business. Those things are all part of your brand, your work, your mission. They aren't side things. They aren't lesser things. And so consider why your story and your path make you uniquely qualified for the work that you do or make you uniquely qualified to talk about something in a unique way. Um, here are a couple examples. Um, I worked with someone who had a training program who by cancer survivors for cancer survivors. Like they had overcome this massive health challenge and their entire way of looking at fitness was different than most fit pros. They, were, they cared about longevity. They cared about quality of life. Um, and that gave them a unique lens to the work that they did. Now, they could have said, oh, but most people aren't cancer survivors. So by niching my business, I'm excluding thousands and millions of people. But actually the reverse happened. When they got more specific, people came out of the woodwork saying, I've never heard someone who does what you do. Like all of these other fitness programs don't really feel like they're for me or don't really feel aligned with what I'm looking for. I want what you do. So be willing to get specific. Another example would be the only business building program that puts spirituality first. So think about what makes you an only. You know, the only program, the only workshop, the only master class, the only event. Um, I was just talking to someone about running an event for introverts specifically. You know, there's so many different angles that you can take on your work. What are some of the ways that you could use your unique story and personality to set your work apart? So take some notes on this for a minute. Okay, we're going to keep flying through this. If you've been getting stuck at all, keep remembering, keep telling yourself it is safe for me to make fast decisions, it's safe for me to play with this, it's safe for me to get all of my ideas out. Okay, next one is point of entry. So the point of entry is the first step that you share. It's the perceived solution, like the solution that people are looking for, the thing that they think is going to fix their problem. It's that entry level tactic that you maybe start with. And it's the light at the end of the tunnel for people. So I often, when I, I work with mostly coaches, and the thing about coaches is that they are uniquely like philosophical, vision-driven, and mission-driven, which sometimes means you live like up here. Like this is your comfort zone. And you maybe secretly in the depths of your soul feel like you're too good for teaching tactics. Um, you're too good, your, your work is too deep to give someone a quick win or a quick fix or a step number one. And I find that one of the biggest secrets to creating a really compelling offer is having a really solid step one that gets people feeling like, oh my gosh, with that single step, 
I can get started on this journey that I've been trying to get on for years. So I'm gonna give you a couple examples so this makes sense. Let's say you're working with people in a health capacity to solve stress issues. So you might say, we'll start with a simple saliva analysis so we can see how your cortisol imbalances are keeping you in fight or flight mode. That's a really simple starting point. You know if you're like a stress coach, there's a lot of other layers that you're gonna get to. You might get into past trauma. You might get into the health of their relationship. You might get into their approval addiction or achievement addiction. But this is a starting point that gives your market hope. It gives them hope that this doesn't have to feel complicated and heavy. Um, another example would be, we'll start, this is straight from Andrew, we'll start by quickly building an engaged Facebook group full of people who are excited and ready to buy everything that you create. Andrew's teaching goes much deeper than this. I mean, you know this, you've been in the room. He covers a lot of different really powerful angles of marketing and business building. But this is his step one because he knows it creates results. He knows it's something that can tactically help people get quick solutions, like get on the path to a scalable business. And someone sitting in his audience is able to look at that and be like, okay, I don't feel like I can build a seven-figure business yet, or I'm still just starting out, but I can see myself being able to get 100 people, or 500 people, or 1,000 people into a Facebook group. So I'm gonna sign up for that. Who here is here because they've gone through GGMB? Quite a few hands in the room, awesome. Um, so that's just one example. So I want you guys to think of what is um, a step one part of your offer, what's the first thing that you would do with a new client that could quickly start getting them traction, wins, momentum, it might be a little audit, it might be a test, it might be a tactical quick thing, and I would recommend starting to talk about that in your marketing, because it really builds hope and desire quickly. About process. So your process is your formula, your 12-step program the prescription that you give someone, the methodology that you walk them through. It's your proprietary method. This is really important because it's another way for you to set, to set you apart from everyone else in your industry. For you to say, I have a five-step program. We're going to walk you through each one of these steps, and after each one of them, you're going to be at this level. Or, I've created this method or this kit, this protocol that's going to get you from A to B. It makes people feel really guided. It makes people feel really taken care of. It really quickly sets you up as, as an expert and an, as an authority for you to say, yeah, I'm not just running your Facebook ads. I have an audience application blueprint that we're going to take you through that's going to get you from here to here. And so it's as simple sometimes as putting some labels on stuff that you're already doing, the stuff that feels really normal and basic to you that your audience isn't doing, and it's going to be life-changing for them. But just putting some titles on it, putting some labels on it, naming your method can really take people from, oh, she's just another one of the crowd, to, oh, no one else is talking about this like branded method. So a couple examples. Um, with the balanced plate protocol, you can eat whatever you want at every meal as long as you run it through your customized macro formula. Another example, we'll write a soap opera sequence that turns your readers into addicted fans and gets them hyped to buy. So for this one, I want you to think about stuff that you already do. Exercises you might take your clients through, the different key milestones on your own journey, and think about how you could build them into a five-step process or, you know, can you slap a name on your journey, your protocol that would take you from generic, like, jack-of-all-trades service provider, or coach, or consultant to, oh, he has a branded method that he's talking about that makes me really want to lean in. It makes me really curious. I want to hear more about this unique solution. So take a minute and jot down some notes about that. All right, now we're going to talk about path. So this is the experience of someone getting from A to Z. Um, this is the client experience that you designed. This is the clearest path to get them to the finish line. It's the way that you're actually structuring the container for your work. So my first recommendation is 
think about this person that you identified, this group of people that you identified. What are some of the feelings that they want to experience, that you think they'd want to experience in their work with you? Are they looking for luxury? Are they looking for simplicity? Are they looking for speed? Are they looking to be really guided and supported? Are they looking for an intensive, challenging, boundary-stretching experience? Are they looking for more ease, flow, fun? That's going to be different for everyone in the room, but that should impact the way you actually build out what your offer looks like. Because some of you guys, your people are detail people. Maybe they're beginners, and they want like 80 hours of video with every detail because they feel insecure. They feel like they've got a lot of knowledge to learn, and they want guidance, tactics, all of the things. Some of your audience, they look at 80 hours of video that you list on your sales page, and they're like, okay, bye. I don't have time for that. Like, I'm busy. I'm managing, like, life and business and all the things. I am looking for laser fast, laser focused solutions. So again, it's going to be different, but here's a couple examples. Both of these examples are written for um, writing coaches. Okay, someone who's taking, inviting someone into the process of them writing their book, and I want you to see how different they are. So the first one, get every chapter of my book delivered to your inbox as it's written, along with straight from my journal notes on the writing process. Plus, get invited to a few private video chats where I'll be sharing off-the-cuff thoughts about writer's block, getting my book out into the world, and finding my voice in this new season. So this writing coach is, her audience is looking for intimacy. They want like behind the scenes access to her, her and who she is, and they really wanna like get into her process and get like real time behind the scenes knowledge of what she's doing. Join me at my San Diego office for a day where we'll outline your best selling book, map out a viral book launch, and film a behind the scenes interview to leverage as a pre-order bonus. This person is looking for an expert formula. They're looking for one day laser focused implementation and they've got goals of like hitting the bestseller list and having a really like complicated mapped out like entire book launch sequence. This is a great example of how two people can be doing kind of exactly the same thing and be inviting in a totally different audience. Guys, there's room for all of us. And there are people looking for writer number one, and there are people looking for writer number two. Um, so there aren't any rules about what your offer gets to feel like. You get to decide, am I doing VIP days? Am I doing master classes? Am I doing group coaching where there's a lot of collaboration and community and connection? Am I doing one-on-one -on -one work? Um, I think Andrew's talking tomorrow about his maximization model, and he'll talk about some of the pros and cons of those different structures. But for right now, lean into what you think would be best for your audience. Okay, we're going to keep moving. Time is ticking. Provisions. So provisions are the deliverables. It's the goods. It's the assets and the resources that you're handing over to your clients, whether that's a two-hour class with a single worksheet or whether it's a year-long mastermind program where you're inviting them into a set number of calls and a retreat and you have video modules and all of the things. Um, that last one where I say the assets and resources that make the journey easier slash faster slash better, that's another example of where you need to take your audience's desires into mind. Are your people looking for something easy to, like a process that makes them feel like, oh, I'm taken care of. This is going to make this easier. Are they looking for it to be faster? Are they looking for it to be deeper, more luxurious, more intimate, more hands-off, more automated? Um, and how can you give them a template, a script, a swipe file, a kit, a step-by-step -step checklist, a success roadmap, a kickoff call? Like, What things could you implement along the way to get them out of places they might get stuck? What resources have you already created that you can start talking about in your marketing as pieces of your offer? Or if you haven't created an offer yet and you're kind of pulling from your own journey, 
where did you get stuck on your journey or where did it feel hard? And is there a training, a worksheet or an exercise that you, that would have really helped you at that phase? How could you build that into your program? Here's a couple of examples. A weekly meal prep kit with a grocery list, recipe set and cooking schedule so you can prep for an entire week in just an afternoon. This little thing could be the tipping point from someone feeling like, oh, this new diet that I'm going on is, feels really hard and overwhelming, and I don't know if I have time for this, to them feeling like, oh, I can do this. She's got my back. The exact cold pitch script I've used to land dozens of five-figure clients. So right there, I'm like, oh, I was kind of feeling awkward about the fact that I've never sent a pitch before. I don't know what I'd write, or I'm not that great with words, but he's handing this over, I'm going to be set. Plus, it, this second example kind of reduces risk by showing that you're giving them proven, road-tested tactics. So think about a couple templates, worksheets, scripts, or things that you could build into your offer and start talking about in your marketing. All right, for these last three, I'm going to run through them pretty quickly just so that I can honor the time frame that was set. Um, so the first one is protection. So protection is how are you building certainty, proof, or accountability into your offer so that people feel safe joining. So I see a lot of people do money back guarantees um, or like get a full refund if you decide this isn't for you within 14 days. And that's fine. I don't have anything against those. I think those can make people feel a little bit better about joining. However, if we actually go a layer deeper, the reason people are excited or feel a little better if there's a money back guarantee is because in their head, there's still a chance that they fail at this. There's still a chance that this won't work. And so one of the things that I build into my offers and the way that I like write them out, the way that I communicate them, is I think about my audience and I'm like, okay, what are they worried might derail them? So let's think about someone who has a diet offer. One of the biggest reasons someone might want a money-back guarantee or that they might feel a little risky is they're, they're not actually worried about your program. They're saying, I've done this whole eat better thing a million times, and like 12 days in, when I haven't had sugar and carbs for 12 days, and I turn into like a hangry, mean version of myself, I like and then I'm at the grocery store and like the cookies find their way into my cart by accident, and then I'm done. That's what they're worried about. They're not worried that your program won't work necessarily. So by building in something to your offer that actually addresses that fear and says, actually, I'm standing with you. Like I get that that's a problem and I'm gonna be right by your side making sure that doesn't happen because I've been there. That makes them feel very understood, very seen, and suddenly that fear is alleviated, at least a little bit. Another example, um, with video tutorials for every step so that even the most tech-challenged person can navigate Facebook Ads Manager with ease. Again, they're like, oh, I don't know if I want to buy this course because I know what happens when like buttons show up on my screen. Well, it's all out the window, and I know that I'm just going to X out the course and go back to the way that I've been doing marketing that isn't working because Facebook Ads Manager feels too hard. So what can you build into your program to actually address those fears, those risks, those sticking points, so that, sure, you can give someone a money back guarantee, but there are actually other levels of protection of you just being a leader and delivering a great product. Like I said, time is ticking, so I'm going to keep going, but hopefully you're able to take just a couple notes there. Um, number nine is polarity. So polarity is what's not included in your offer? What's different? What's the belief that sets you apart? What are you standing against? What, are you, what do you feel like your industry gets wrong? And what can you say about that? Because if you're feeling it, there are people in your market who are feeling it. And they're not wanting to hire the other coaches, um, agencies, service providers out there because there's something that just feels off, even if they can't put their finger on it. 
Um, but when you say something like this, that diets are actually the worst way to lose weight, so we've built our program another way, or build a seven-figure business without a complicated funnel. That's one of the things Andrew talks about all the time. He's built his business entirely organically. He doesn't have eight million complicated funnels running on the background. He's setting himself against what many business builders in his space are talking about. And I know that there are people in this audience who like the reason you're here is something about Facebook ads just doesn't feel right for the way that you want to run your business right now or something about the complexity that marketers are talking about doesn't feel right to the business you want to create. And if you were in the room last night, you saw people making money with a like two sentence Facebook post that Andrew taught. Who saw that? Yeah. It was crazy, right? You're here because you wanted simplicity and because Andrew said, I'm actually going to take a stand against some of the like common practices right now. Not that they're evil, not that they're wrong, but I'm gonna do things my own way, I'm gonna do things differently, and that's how he's built his tribe, and that's gonna be one of the ways that you guys build your tribe. Number 10 is the phone a friend uh, factor. So this is, is your offer and the work that you do, is it simple and clear enough that someone else talks about it and it makes sense? So I heard Matt go up there with his share and he said, Kristen helps men with their screwed up love lives. And I thought that was a great example of like what I call the phone a friend factor of like, oh, someone actually knows how to communicate it. They're talking about it in layman's terms. They're not using lingo. Um, they're giving a short version that people actually got. Like we all nodded and we're like, oh yeah, like we get what Kristen does now. Like it makes sense. Um, so here are a couple examples. He helps divorced dads get more first dates, or she helps stay-at-home moms make money with MLMs. Think through, how would you like a normal person on the street to talk about your work? What would they say in a single sentence? And if it's too pie in the sky, too complex, my guess is that you're getting stuck on trying to serve that big ripple like we talked about before throwing that rock in the middle to a really narrow group. Or you're in that like high level coach, I'm seeing the whole philosophy, the whole concept, and I'm like too good for tactics. Like we're not gonna talk about what we actually do here, we're just gonna talk about concepts. So if you don't know how to like condense your work into a sentence that like your parents would understand, that's probably what happen what's happening. Okay, so we got through all 10. Um, who realized that there's a piece of their offer or the work that they're already doing that they're like not even talking about in their marketing? Yeah, that happens all the time. There's like a really compelling thing that people need to know. And because it's just so normal to you, it's just the way that you do your brilliant work, you don't talk about it. Who realized that they have been held back by making this all like too scary or vague? Who had a new idea about some component of their offer that feels fun or exciting and that you're ready to go put into practice? Okay, awesome. I'm thrilled to hear that. I'll be around if you want to talk more about offers. I could jam about them all day long. But I just want to leave you with this. You already have what you need to create an epic offer. You have a life that has prepared you for exactly for where you are. You already have the expertise that you need. And if you're still stuck, it may be because you are allowing yourself to stay stuck because that feels safe. Whereas actually defining what you want to do and actually putting something out there would make you risk failure. And you're not letting that be an option yet. So I encourage you guys to make the bold decision about who you're going to serve, how you're going to package your work, what you're going to start narrowing in on. Um, and I'm excited to see your offers out there.